Addiction is a weird thing because it can be both physical and mental, right? And I've um, had experience with both slightly. Physical addiction, for sure, I would say I felt the pull of that when I tried cigarettes, which was in like, what, the third grade, second grade, somewhere in there, um, in Brockton, Massachusetts, the tough little neighborhood. I had a friend who uh, smoked, and well, a bunch of friends who smoked, but they basically stole their parents' cigarettes and um, gave them to me to try. And, and at first I would just pretend to inhale and just try to look cool, try to fit in doing it. But eventually they called me out on it and I inhaled and I actually swallowed the smoke. I inhaled wrong and swallowed it. And it was disgusting. I coughed up phlegm for a really long time. Uh, it was hideous. So that ended my my smoking days. But for years afterward, I did feel the pull of nicotine um, calling me back to smoke cigarettes. But I didn't listen. So even with a physical addiction, there's a choice involved. You can listen to it or not. Um, the other addiction that I've um, had pretty much all my life was a food addiction. And I guess that is arguably uh, a physical addiction, although I tend to think not as much as not. <laughs> um, and uh, this um, this is going to be a good conversation after having the one about depression. Hopefully, um, as we're going along in these episodes, if you're doing the work, then you don't need to listen to any of the rest of the episodes. Hopefully you're becoming a clear vessel and no longer polluted with these, these anchors, these ghosts of the past, these inner children, the whatever word you want to use, these emotional, emotionally stifling behaviors. Because in the end, we see that the emotionally stifling behavior doesn't merely come from events in our lives, but is a smokescreen for keeping us the way that we are, keeping the self intact so that we don't actually have to deal with uh, that which is beyond the self because um, that which be is beyond the self is timeless and the self is psychological time. So in order to be one, you can't be the other. <laughs> uh, so instead of being timeless, which requires the psychological self to, uh, be completely dissolved, uh, that self wants to bring timelessness into it. So we want to have love and we want to have joy and we want to have fulfillment um, as things within our psychological selves as we are, which they can't be. And so they become, therefore, things of the opposite. They become an oppositional force to um, what we really are, which is a product of sorrow. Um, the depression, the anger, the pain, you know, all of that. Um, when we, when we drag timelessness into time, we're creating an opposite. Whereas timelessness has no opposite. It transcends and includes time. Perhaps this is a discussion best left for our undoing.com. So please join me there and we'll continue that discussion. But for now, let's talk about my favorite overeating. <laughs> uh, this for me came about after, um, the divorce, my parents' divorce or separation, uh, and, uh, being molested and all that fun stuff. Um, my response to that was depression was, you know, the, to the, the pain, uh, was to take it out of myself. I turned it inward and, that's probably partly how I became a sarcastic person. Um, you know, these sort of passive aggressive things because the, the real aggression you're taking out on yourself. Um, and overeating was a, a big one, but it wasn't just because of that. I mean, there are certain ingredients that go into the recipe of my being an overeater, if you will. But once you mix them all together and put them in the oven, the thing that, um, turns the oven on high 
and bakes them is the divorce and is the um, the molestation. But the ingredients uh, started off prior to that. One problem was um, our parents weren't big on giving us dessert. And of course, all you want to eat is dessert when you're a kid, right? So we had grandparents who, when we would go visit them, they would have all the, the sugary cereals, the Captain Crunch and the Lucky Charms and the Cookie Crisp, all the things that you should never put into your body. That's what they fed us, which was great. And apple pies and and my grandmother's famous raspberry pie, famous to me. <laughs> You've never heard of it. But trust me, it's delicious. I mean, just pies for days. Rhubarb pie, ah, blueberry pie, blackberry pie, all kinds of pies would be waiting for us. And then sugary cereal in the morning. And we were allowed to just have a free-for-all when we went to our grandparents' place. Um, this is on my mom's side. The same thing on my dad's side, but different desserts and in greater moderation for sure. Um, all delicious. So going to the grandparents is this anticipation, this great, like, uh, we got to devour this stuff while we can and as quickly as we can because there's a whole bunch of people here so <laughs> in competition for this food. So that was one one piece of the pie, if you will, one, one of the ingredients. Uh, the other was that our parents would let us, uh, my sister and I, I have a sister. I don't know if I have mentioned her in any of this, but um, I have a sister. And we were both put on a leash <laughs> when it came to desserts. Like maybe we would have Oreo cookies. Maybe. And if we did, you had to like finish your plate or you had to have three more forkfuls of the very thing that was disgusting that you didn't want. Usually for me, that would be broccoli, definitely cauliflower, and absolutely horrendous liver. My dad would cook liver and that would make me want to vomit. Uh, so three more forkfuls and you can have your two cookies um, or three cookies. I think we were limited to two. And then if we begged, sometimes we would be allowed three, but that was it. And so I think this having to, um, engulf all of your food, just dying to get to that dessert really quickly or stuffing your face with three more forkfuls to get to that dessert, which is the thing you really want. That's another ingredient. Third one is that we had a babysitter in Brockton, Massachusetts, who would feed us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and wouldn't let us drink until we were done. And peanut butter made me really, really thirsty. But if I wanted that glass of milk or that glass of water, I had to scarf it down because it so dries your mouth that to me, I mean, I'm like, I'm dying. I, I need to get to that, that beverage. So that was another ingredient. And then... Later in life, uh, after the divorce, I mean, my mom hated to cook. If we were lucky, she would cook us a pork chop, and that wasn't lucky because we didn't like pork chops so much. Sorry, Mom. Really, the greatest meat of all was, uh, was pot roast. I mean, let's face it. When done right, delicious. I digress. Uh, look, my food addiction is catching up with me even now. <laughs> um, so... My mom, not a big fan of cooking, and after uh, my mom and dad separated, um, mostly we ate garbage. We lived with our mom. She worked full-time. She would leave us money to buy, you know, we had a pizza place down the street, so we'd buy pizza and subs and things like that, um, but usually it was McDonald's uh, or Burger King or Friendly's, which of course is famous for their ice cream sundaes. And when we would eat ice cream sundaes, we would have a contest to see who could finish first because my mom always finished first for some reason. So my sister and I would just start scarfing down just to see if we could beat her. And, um, those are ingredients <laughs> in the recipe for overeating disaster. And then finally, I think, um, probably a more, obvious now, but unconscious part of it was my mom had a really, and still does, bad habit of eating your food before she would ever eat her food. Like once she put it down, she would say something like, or still does say things like, oh, uh, can I, uh, I, I just need to try a bite of that. I just need a bite. And would help herself to your food. And, you know, it's your mom and she either bought it or made it. 
Um, you got to share. But her bites weren't just little bites. They were overbearing bites. And, of course, it's an invasion of your space, of your eating space. It's, it's a lack of boundaries on her part. And one bite often turns into two or three. And um, before you know it, you've won the ice cream eating contest because she's eaten your ice cream, too. I mean, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. Uh, so you have to, like, eat and sort of hoard your food before, you know, your mom decides she wants to eat five or six bites, <laughs> heaping bites of your food. Uh, so that was an issue. All of these were issues in in me becoming um, an overeater. And then, of course, you develop this taste and you just love food. And sugar, of course, and all that garbagey stuff. And then they say, you know, sugar can be physically addictive or is physically addictive, but I'm not buying it. And I'm not buying it because, well, first, let me just say, when I was a, an adult, I went on the Atkins diet for a while. I had done dieting before. I had done Weight Watchers and, you know, whatever. I'm sure Slim Fast or whatever. <laughs> In fact, uh, hypnosis. I tried self-hypnosis tapes with my mom for overeating. It's like we're doing self-hypnosis tapes for overeating together as a, um, a teen or a tween or whatever I was, but not actually cutting out the bad habits. <laughs> like We just want something to stop us. We don't want to stop ourselves. And that's the same thing with Weight Watchers, right? You go to these meetings, you get weighed in, everybody gives you affirmations. You want someone else to do the work for you or to tell you, what a great job you're doing. It's, it's not enough for you. It's not enough for the body to be healthy. Um, because that's the nature of being unhealthy, is that you want to remain unhealthy, because that's what you are. Uh, it's the same physically as it is with this mental stuff we're talking about often. So I did go on the Atkins diet uh, as an adult living in New York, and uh, for the Atkins diet, it's basically you're cutting out carbs, you're eating a ton of meat and eggs. So no bread, no pasta. And I, I can't remember, I think it was like 19 grams of carbs for the first two weeks. So really you can eat nothing except meat and cheese. Um, that's really it. Um, so after the first, and after the two weeks, then you graduate, right? You get You get more carbs in your diet. And after a few days, there is, you know, you smell everything in the air. You smell bread like you've never smelled before. Your nose comes alive and you're like dying for pasta and bread and carbs, sugar, sweet, glorious sugar. But after that, I mean, if I guess that's the physical addiction. And after the first few days of cold turkey, just about, um, it goes away. Maybe the first week, let's say seven days. I mean, you think it's not. You think, like, you're going to die. And then after about a week, you're fine. And, in fact, I was so fine that I decided, you know what? I don't even want to skip this um, 19 grams of carbs. I, I want to – I think it was 19. It was either 15 or 19. I think it was 19, but don't quote me. Whatever it was, I wanted to stick with it. Um, so I stayed on, on that initial uh, crash of just meats and cheeses for maybe about three months. And in that time, I lost 60 pounds, um, which was, um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Which was <laughs> an amazing feat. And I kept it off for a really long time. Actually, I kept it off until um, I started doing late night editing sessions for Nickelodeon um, for the Snick House video pick. And uh, when you're in an editing bay, they pretty much just put like every amazing, awful Hershey's candy bar treat at your disposal and pay for your meals. And usually, you know, you're getting high carbohydrate meals and stuff. So after that, after late night candy and food sessions on the company dime, um, I uh, ballooned back up, but it took a while. Uh, then I went back to um, normal crappy eating habits. Although I, I remember I had tried McDonald's after not having eaten McDonald's um, for more than three months. I mean, maybe for a year, maybe longer. And it actually tasted like, I don't know, poison, a hallucinogenic something. 
like I was dizzy, I was foggy. Um, it, it just had a lot of effects on me. Like you, you don't realize what crap you're eating until you stop eating and, and then try to go back to it. And it was just terrible. So I actually didn't pick that back up uh, for a good number of years more. <laughs> Eventually, um, I ended up living across the street from a McDonald's. So um, I started eating it again <laughs> in, in Queens and in Forest Hills. Uh, and actually, it was then in Forest Hills in Queens, and it was after all of the um, quote-unquote spiritual shenanigans, after I'd done uh, what what we're walking through together on this show, after I'd done all that stuff. So it's after I'd moved to heart, out of brain and into heart, and then even beyond, quote-unquote beyond, after I had the bigger experience that, you know, we can talk about, well, maybe I'll talk about it on another season, or you could just go to ourundoing.com and I'll, I'm absolutely talking about it there. Um, but after I'd done all this stuff, gotten into right relationship uh, with life, the universe, and everything, I was uh, I was back to uh, McDonald's. I still had awful eating habits, um, and the Atkins diet, uh, staying on you know just no carbs, is an awful eating habit. None of these things are good eating habits. But they were just what I was doing. They weren't uh, a, a result of a compulsion from um, my psychological past, from traumas, from a, a means of eating away my pain. This is not what I was doing. I was just doing it because that's what I ate. It's what I was comfortable eating. Until one day, I, I got up early enough, because I was a late riser back then, um, I got up early enough to go to McDonald's to get the McGriddle, which if you've never had a McGriddle, I, I don't even remember at this point what was in it, but, um, uh, slow death is what was in it. I think it was like a pancake with the syrup in it or something. I mean, it was delicious. It was absolutely delicious. And so I was so psyched to, to get up and get this thing. And my feet just kept on walking. Like literally my body, uh, like a cartoon was like, nope. We're going to keep on walking. And um, so I followed my, I guess, instinct and kept walking to Trader Joe's, bought a bunch of vegetables because I had a Trader Joe's down the street for me, too. Bought a bunch of vegetables um, and, and vegetarian stuff. And the whole time I'm thinking, why am I doing this? What is this about? And from that moment on, I was a vegetarian and I'm still a vegetarian. So that's. Certainly a possibility, I suppose, after all of this stuff where the body knows what it needs to do and is doing it, <laughs> despite despite your conscious interest in, in the McGriddle. Um, so that's why I say I don't, I don't think that these things are necessarily physical addictions. But also, I think if we take a closer look at what this overeating is about, what these addictions are about, um, we may find that there is something deeper going on here when we say we're trying to fill a hole in our lives. I mean, the ironic thing is, what we need to be doing is getting clear. Not filling the hole, but becoming less of the things that we are filling ourselves with. <laughs> Uh, becoming more nothing and less something, or in this case, something else, which is still something, right? I mean, we're constantly doing therapy and trying to create a bigger, better self as a means to move on and greet these challenges in a healthier way, to have less and less stress in our life, to have less anxiety, less sorrow, but never the elimination of because we can't. We can't have the elimination of that which we are. We can have greater or lesser amounts of the ingredients. But the self is still those ingredients, so the ingredients are going to remain. And so when we say that we're, we're filling a hole, then we try to get to the bottom of that through whatever form of um, therapy that we do. Even if, if it's simply talking to a friend, we, we want to figure that out. 
if we're self-aware at all. If we're not, then we just carry on filling that hole and eating away and drinking and doing drugs and whatever it is. We become sort of physical avatars representing our inner selves. The degraded self must be matched by the degradation of the physical self. And all of this um, because what we need to do is die internally, not the body die, but we translate that into physical death through slower, fast suicide. Uh, all, anything to not deal with this one notion that is that the self must go. So again, in therapy, we, we deal with these issues we, by saying, okay, why, what's the hole that needs to be filled? And then we try to even it out. We try to fill it in in a healthy way. We try to understand that there is a problem and then fix the problem so that we can move on as a lesser problem in a problematic world. But then an odd thing happens, which is that many of us meditate or we pray. And what is that doing? That is clearing away the clutter of the mind to have this clear, well, in terms of prayer, a clear line to an entity or of some sort or a deity or whatever it is that we project. Um, but in meditation, it's just a clear mind becomes a clear vessel. Watch your thoughts, you know, that sort of thing. Um, essentially get rid of thought. Unfortunately, in both instances, there's still this notion of a separate self doing these things, praying, meditating, watching thoughts that are not you that are separate from you. Um, so it's not going to work in any ultimate sense, but it'll alleviate the pain for a little while and you can carry on and it's a form of therapy. So maybe a way to look at all of these various forms of therapy, and yes, I'm including prayer and meditation in that as well, is to think of them as means to becoming more self-aware, but not so that you can just go on with life as is, as this ultimately self-aware person, um, but so that you don't have a lot of thoughts and emotions and your own projections blocking you from being able to listen to what's being said here, which is simply me making loud and clear what your own inner voice has been telling you that you've been blocking out all along, that little tiny voice in the back of your head, um, which is simply that the self isn't it. Yes, you need a clear, healthy self to be able to listen and hear and understand that the self must dissolve for truth to become the case, for wholeness to be the case. We're like a potential butterfly trapped in its own cocoon and refusing to chew its way out. We're trying to chew everything else. <laughs> We're chewing up the furniture, uh, but we won't, you know, we, we don't want to, we don't want to actually become the butterfly because the butterfly is completely different, a completely different creature or so it seems than the, the pupa that's sitting inside the cocoon. And so we would rather idealize or demonize or pretend that that doesn't exist or pretend that it is separate from you. And there's this dualism butterfly me. I don't want to be that you want it to be a choice. I, I don't want to be that, or I do want to be that. And then you live in that choice, right? This is what like the new age would live in the choice of I am being that right now. Meanwhile, you're still in the cocoon. And um, everyone else might be like, um, well, I don't want that. Or I don't acknowledge that that is me at all. Therefore, it isn't. But it is you. And so you can't do that forever or uh, you're going to die in that cocoon. The butterfly species will not exist. And that's where we are. Right? So certainly it is better to understand our issues and why it is that we're constantly trying to, quote unquote, fill a hole within ourselves than it is to blindly fill that hole with our favorite addiction of choice. But it is even more transformatively correct, to coin a term, to see this greater context in which it is necessary to stop filling the hole. 
not to go on with life as usual, but feeling a little bit better for now and then finding another reason to feel miserable, but then having better coping skills when you feel that way. That's not what life is. I mean, it's how we live it, but that's us in the cocoon living it. And it's us preserving the self, preserving the cocoon, despite not just our ability to fly, but the necessity, because that is what human nature is, or butterfly nature. But you know what I mean. Deep down, we all know. Which makes it sound like it's a matter of accepting or rejecting, and it's not. It's a matter of simply understanding all of this. And if there be a transformative moment, a chewing through the cocoon, understanding is the way, is the chewing. It's not that you understand and then do something about it. This is where the analogy fails, is that there is no you chewing. Understanding chews the cocoon. Understanding alleviates the self and brings us that much closer to our own true fulfilling that process is really what we're about. But again, we, we redirect that, we repress it and redirect it. And we say that our fulfilling, that sense of fulfilling becomes a sense of purpose in life through the self. I need to do something. I need to be some, a certain somebody. I need to change. I need to, you know, fill in the blank. We want that action to be ours because that is how we remain in the face of this change. But this is the one change where you can't take yourself with you when you go. Nor should you. It's inappropriate. And it may look a certain way, enticing, scary, whatever it does from this side of the cocoon. But from the other side, once you're living in understanding, you see that there was no need to fear. The pupa, the little worm, the cocoon, the butterfly, they're all one being. There is no fear in oneness. There's only fear in separation. That sense, that perspective only exists in separation. Then there's an other, and that other is an unknown, and that unknown is scary. Oh, what to do, what to do? We'll do nothing be no thing, that ultimate timeless self-awareness in which all things are, is the human perspective, is our self-awareness. When the body self-awareness, the body projected brain or heart-based self is abandoned by the body because the body sees the futility of maintaining it and putting it on a pedestal that way. That, not thought, not logic, not empathy, not emotions, that ultimate self-awareness is what humans are for. The rest, which is completely out of whack, in which we believe are these great, amazing things, are actually tools of the ultimate. Time is the tool of timelessness. The self is the mask of love. The way that love greets the world when we are no longer in the way. And there are no good words to put to that because it, it sounds as though we just die and then this possessive entity <laughs> takes over or something along those lines. But I guess I, I hearken back to the movie The Abyss. Uh, in the movie The Abyss, people uh, who are going deep underwater um, to survive the pressure, they have to wear these pressurized suits with liquid oxygen um, so when the liquid oxygen fills up the helmet, there's this moment where they think they're going to drown. They don't want to breathe. They hold their breath. They hold their breath. They're afraid they're going to die. And then you have no choice but to suck in oxygen. You breathe. You breathe this liquid and you're breathing. You're breathing liquid, this liquid oxygen in the movie. So you do have to let go. You do have to quote unquote die in order to live. And in that sense, in order to explore the depths. In this ultimate sense, it's in order to be all of the shallows and depths, all of everything, self-aware, at once, in this here body. 
Anger is symbiotic with pain. When we're not in pain, we're not angry. And when we say that pain is a part of life, we give ourselves permission to stay in pain, to treat life as pain and as the lessening of pain uh, as, as sort of the goal or a goal. I wonder what happens when we understand that differently, when we see what truly is, when we stop eating away our pain and understanding choose through the cocoon. <laughs>